So uh, this morning, we want to talk a little bit about what it is when our ideas of the world around us turn out not to be quite so true, and we have to deal with the world that we live in being a little bit different and how God is actually wanting to do things in that real world rather than the one that we kind of made up in our heads. Right? Yeah, I mean, back in the day, I thought, I, I thought that the Shumalaks were great, and then I discovered what troublemakers that they are, and I just can't, I don't know if I can handle that at all. <laughs> no, I've always known they were troublemakers. Okay. So this morning, I wanted to, I wanted to think about a, a story that I had heard. And it was, it was this one, and, and my father told me this story originally, but I've seen it in other places, and it was about Albrecht Dürer. I don't know if I said that right. There's an umlaut. It, it, I learned Spanish, not German. And so Albrecht Dürer was this artist, and there is a painting that he was commissioned to make. And in it, there's, a, there's someone with their hands in prayer, but they're kind of bent a little bit, okay? The hands are bent a little bit. And to prepare for it, Albrecht ended up making a sketch, and they call it the praying hands. And if you look at the sketch, you can see all sorts of different things about it. It's kind of open a little bit. One of the pinkies is kind of crooked a little bit. And you can see all the different tendons and different veins and such in the hands. And they, they look a little bit older. And over time, the painting that he was commissioned to make got destroyed in a fire, but the original sketch that he made has endured. And that's actually been what has stood out to people the most over the years. The thing is, though, that the origin of the story has an interesting story that goes along with it. Now, the way I was told the story is that Albrecht came from a very poor family, and there were 18 children. That's a lot of kids. And, uh, and so with that is that he and his brother both wanted to be artists, but they didn't have the money to go off to art school right away. So what would happen is Albrecht's brother went to go work in the mines, and then Albrecht would go and to art school. And so as his brother worked, he went to art school, and then they were supposed to switch. And he would work, and his brother would go to art school, except when he was ready to go work, Albrecht's brother, his hands were too worn out over time to actually do the art school. And so the story goes that Albrecht made that sketch of his brother's hands as a testimony to the sacrifice that his brother made for him. And it's a beautiful story. It's a great story. Completely not true. It was actually something that probably came up in the 19th century because a lot of people were really interested in Albrecht Dürer's work as an artist, but yeah, it's, uh, that, that's, that's not actually true. In fact, if you look at the praying hands, you don't actually see calluses on the hands. Uh, they're, they're not actually like, they're not actually the, the, the hands of a, of a mine worker. The thing is, though, that oftentimes what we do is we see the things that give us inspiration, and we want to hold on to those. And we have trouble whenever the reality doesn't quite match the story that we had in our heads. Now, the thing is that it's very easy to embellish these things. And so we take passages like 1 John 3, and we look at the imagery of giving one's life for others as an inspiration. And this is one of the many, many, many reasons why it is that we look to our, our law enforcement and our military as sources of inspiration, because let's be honest, wow, what they do for us. Not only that each and every day, day in, day out, that they're willing to put their lives on the line, but also to realize that they'll be taken for granted so often. And that oftentimes the work that they do goes unnoticed. My father's father was in the army but never told me about his time there. My, my mother's father didn't tell me much until after I went to seminary. My dad, who was in the Air Force Reserves, never spoke of his time in the military. And my uncles never told me about their time as well, which is especially sad since my uncles are no longer walking on this earth right now. As a child... I was surrounded by friends in the police department or the sheriff's department. 
The week after one of them retired, the person who took over his patrol was shot and killed in the line of duty, realizing how close it was that his life was on the line. You see, we don't have to embellish the stories of our community protectors to be inspired and see how important they truly are. And yet, we're still oftentimes so afraid when uncomfortable truths come out. See, I remember being here a year and a half ago. I remember being here preaching one of my first sermons about how there are different standards in policing, especially for the African American community. And I remember when I was at the end of service in the narthex and one of the members walking out and saying, I think one of the, I think you got one of the stories about one of the people that you told wrong, but I still agree with the message you were trying to say. Now here's the thing about this. He, I wasn't arguing with him. He wasn't arguing with me. We didn't need to. See, the truth about the specifics of one event didn't change the overall message of what we were learning, and it also didn't make us afraid of that truth. You see, seven months later, we would find out about the death of George Floyd, and what really stood out was the truth was too obvious to ignore anymore. He wasn't treated as a human, not just in a momentary lapse of judgment, which does happen quite often, but in a nine-minute continued decision to care more about putting someone in their place than about whether they could breathe. A $20 bill that may or may not have been counterfeited made all the difference. And let's be honest, we've probably all had a counterfeit 20 in our wallets and didn't realize it. But now that the officer who committed the killing has been found guilty, there has been a sigh of relief. But why? Are we sighing in relief that a murder has been punished, or are we sighing in relief because we just don't want to hear about it anymore? The truth about the death of George Floyd, along with the reality that we face of other inequities in our civilization, in our community, does not need to undermine the hope that we can have of justice and law enforcement and order. They're not mutually exclusive. So then why is it that we spent so much time mocking people who demonstrated with somehow that would take away the hurt of the death of this man? But you see, the death of George Floyd is not the only form of death that we were looking at in this because it was also the death of what many of us thought we knew about our society. My mother is one of the biggest supporters of the military and law enforcement by far, and I remember sitting with her in the car on the way to my uncle's funeral and hearing her say out of nowhere, my sister and I never realized just how bad things are in this country for some people. My mother is not perfect by any means. She decorates her entire place in chickens. I don't know what is up with that. She has a fascination with chickens. She always has. It's really strange. Chickens, chickens, chickens. Okay. But she also doesn't realize sometimes how much the little things that she has said over the years have had the biggest influence. You know, mothers always want to say something that's meaningful and it kind of goes right over your head, but then they say something offhand and then that's what sticks with you 30 years later. Yeah. You see, in many ways, we see the need for the death of our preconceived notions of ourselves, of our world, of our way of doing things. This is one of the things that we have been so angry about in recent times. See, it's not always about one issue or one stance that we get so upset. It's oftentimes about losing the previous way we looked at the world. Somehow we're afraid that that will undermine our lives going forward because something is not the way we thought it was. And this is in many ways what we see with the Apostle Peter. What he thought he knew about the Messiah had turned out to be wrong. He had told Jesus to stop talking about dying and got shut down. He had tried to fight the soldiers on Jesus' behalf and got told to put his sword away. He was ashamed of Jesus being arrested, and he got put in his place by a rooster crowing. Peter's perception of what he thought the Messiah was all about turned out to be wrong 
So, did that mean that the Messiah was not real? Absolutely not. It means the way he saw the Messiah was wrong and needed to be changed to match the reality. See, it wasn't Peter's physical death that would prove that he truly loved Jesus. It would be his death to who he was and what he believed he knew about the Messiah. Look at what John said in his first letter. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. And it's so easy to stop at the idea of death. And yet, let's look at what it says next. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. It's so easy to talk a good game about wanting the world to change. It's something else entirely to do so with the way that we live our lives. Whether it's letting go of trying to have the last word and trusting that God can win an argument in the end. Whether it's turning off a Netflix series once a week to spend time with kids who need role models. Whether it's turning down an additional 3% on a house offer so that a veteran or a desperate pastor can buy the house. Thank you, Phoebe. The thing is that Oftentimes we have to let go of what we think was important so that we can lead to the world that we actually want to see. A world of grace and hope and love. And when all is said and done, the truth about people is always a little bit complicated. Civil rights leaders may have had affairs. Presidents may have had scandals. Those who have had to speak the truth about violence in our community are human too and make mistakes. But if we continually look to make people into villains instead of listening to what needs to be said, how will we ever make the world better when everyone is guilty of something? If we ignore everything that ever comes across because we can find a flaw in them, then what will we ever have to learn? It's like what I read on Facebook this weekend. If someone truly loves, cares about, wants to be with you, then they can't be ran off easily and will circle back around in your life. So relax and don't stress. Yeah, you know which one it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. And that was what Peter finally got to see. It wasn't about some battle or public attack that Jesus wanted to use. It was about being willing to die to who he was before and pick up the new perspective from the actual Messiah with him. And that's how Peter became the rock of the church. He saw that the crucifixion of Jesus led to a new life, one of glory that only came by letting go of the old and moving forward into the new. Instead of fighting the priests and the Sadducees when they arrested him and John, Peter was led by a new way of viewing the world. Look at the difference the Peter before the crucifixion and the Peter after the resurrection. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. As much as the Sadducees wanted to hold on to their previous way of looking at the world and thereby missed the real Jesus standing right in front of them. Peter had lost the old way. He picked up the new one from the real Messiah. And so as great as a story as it might be about Albrecht Durer and his having a brother whose hands were sketched, the reality is that the praying hands were actually modeled after a real person with a real life and real experiences traced in those palms. As much as we admire everything that those who protect us have done for us, the reality is that we are sinful, imperfect human beings. And not every decision that has been made in the moment should be ignored when the reality 
has created victims in our lives. And we do have something to learn. And as much as Peter had a beautiful idea of what he expected from Jesus, it was the real Jesus who brought real hope and a real resurrection to a broken world. And isn't that a good thing? When we let go of our previous notions of how the world is supposed to be, then we can see the beautiful and amazing things that are right in front of us, the opportunities that God actually has for us. We can ask questions about how better to support our law enforcement and our military. We can help them to make better decisions instead of leaving our veterans out on the street wondering if they actually have some way of taking care of themselves. We can actually work alongside our you know, neighborhood patrols and actually take care of our communities with grace and compassion instead of getting mad when people make mistakes trying to fix our problems for us. We can solve issues of poverty and homelessness by looking at the issues that actually lead to people living in poverty and homelessness instead of just painting with broad strokes over everybody. We can finally become the children of God that God saved us to be instead of trying to be some version or image that isn't reality and not meant to be reality. And by letting go of the previous way that we view the world, we can live in a world where God is really doing amazing things that we are a part of. So in closing, I'm going to let you know that, believe it or not, I have flaws. I know that's hard to believe. I know. It's the hair. So if you want to find my flaws, they're not that hard to find. You don't have to look that deep. But for some reason, God used this Gilmore girl watching Broken Vessel who did not have time to hang out with two of his friends this weekend because he needed to check on someone who was living alone, who needed to speak of words of comfort to a friend going through a rough patch and help make someone's house a little more beautiful. Because if we spend all of our time trying to live in what we wish the world were like, then we'll miss out on how amazing God wants to use the world that actually exists to do beautiful things around, through, and in us. May God continue to use our broken, sinful selves to bring grace to a world that will never deserve it, but desperately needs it. Thanks be to God.